Hello everyone. In our last talk, we referred to James Cousins' uh, book, uh, New Ways in English Literature, and wondered why Sri Aurobindo referred to it in his essays on poetry. Before we attempt to answer that, let us take a very quick refresher on who was James Cousins. Now, James Cousins was not particularly an English writer. I mean, he was from Ireland. He was an Irish writer of the 20th century. He was poet, author, teacher, critic, all. In our times, his writings are analyzed and discussed sometimes as part of the post-colonial discourse. But Sri Aurobindo's use of Cousins' work was, of course, for a completely different purpose and brought in from a different perspective. So we must see how it relates to the future poetry and especially to the chapter called the mantra of which it forms a good portion. In fact, the future poetry is not the only work of Sri Aurobindo where James Cousins and his writings find mention and are discussed and alluded to. But Sri Aurobindo wrote another series of absolutely brilliant essays on a completely different subject and for which he adopted the title of another one of James Cousins' book called The Renaissance in India. Even here, Sri Aurobindo found Cousins' essays illuminating enough to go through and analyze them. And in the future poetry, when he refers to Cousins' new ways in English literature, it is because, um, or rather one of the reasons for which Sri Aurobindo admires this is for its great style, perfect measure, profound observation, keen insight. And these are exactly Sri Aurobindo's words. And of course, that's a good many merits. And indeed, the book is a great help as Sri Aurobindo says. Now, James Cousins comes to us basically as a critic here, taking up certain literary works and authors for analysis. So what happens when we take up a book of criticism? We get to know about the works and authors critiqued from and through the perspective of the critic. Needless to say, critical work includes a good measure of the subjective element in the analysis and the personal viewpoint of the critic gets reflected in that. In James Cousins' book, what we get is an estimate of literary works which the author has chosen to comment upon. And it is as if we get almost a direct knowledge of these works as we would get if we study them ourselves. This is why Sri Aurobindo says his is a vital and illuminative criticism and has all praises for Cousins' distinctive critical and literary temperament. James Cousins, as we find from his critical writings, imbibed the creative tendencies of the times he lived in and in a great way helped to direct and form the cre creative and critical temperament of his age. Therefore, Sri Aurobindo says that Cousins displays the spirit of positive criticism and he goes on to explain that this kind of positive criticism includes and is built upon the virtues of sympathy and understanding and skillful discernment, restraint and measure. In fact, uh, so let us now view or uh, say review what a critical work entails. What do we expect from a work of criticism? Or let us put it this way, what is criticism? As Sri Aurobindo wrote in one of his letters that all criticism of poetry has strong subjective element in it. And that's the source of the violent differences in the appreciation of a work by critics. And he goes on to add that our appreciation depends on the consciousness which views and appreciates. 
And of course, theories, canons, standards do vary from age to age. And it's very really true because see, every age doesn't share the same passion or hold the same opinion of the same thing. So as for the subjective note, it must creep in even when we are trying to look at a poem objectively. For we have already said criticism itself is a kind of creative work. But when Sri Aurobind is explaining the art of criticism, it is not only in historical terms. His primary thrust is on the level of consciousness which the critic has reached. In a letter of 1947, Sri Aurobindo wrote that critical judgment depends usually on a personal reaction determined by the critic's temperament or the aesthetic trend in him or by values, rules or canons which are settled for his intellect and agree with the viewpoint from which his mind receives whatever comes to him for judgment. So we find that the personal element becomes part of any criticism, any critical work. <coughs> we find positive notes in James Cousins' work. But the most interesting and important point that Sri Aurobindo makes is that Cousins' criticism tends more towards the spiritual rather than the merely earthly. So it's only reasonable that in talking about the spiritual dimensions of poetry, Sri Aurobindo should use this book as a starting referral material. As Cousins' book leans towards the spiritual, to the inward and subjective rather than the outward and objective only. Also, it looks more to the life within and behind rather than to the life in front. James Cousins also shows his preference for the lyrical to the dramatic mode. Okay, so um, let us take a look into James Cousins' book uh, for a few instances of what Sri Aurobindo suggests as positive criticism, which includes all these features. Uh, for instance, in his essay on Rabindranath Tagore, Cousins writes, and I'm quoting, in reading any new poet, I instinctively search for his greatest word, that is a declaration that has springing out of it the greatest range of branches and twigs of vision and thought. That attained the rest of the poet's utterances put on an illuminating perspective. And later in the essay he says, there is need for that conscious expression of race and when a true poet lifts nationality to the level of art, it becomes a far more potent force than it is at the level of prose. Similarly, writing about the poet Yeats, Cousins says he makes a generalized statement thus. He says, the genius of Ireland and of Yeats is vagrant and lyrical. In time, it may acquire stability and its earthly twin, solidity and extensiveness. Though we may hold the faith that such gain might be at the expense of a quality of much higher spiritual value than mere bulk. And then he says, and it's a very important sentence where he's saying, to evolve an eternity of noble lines may be a mighty achievement of the mind. To put eternity into a single line, as Yeats has done, is the miracle of the spirit. So Cousins points out that art cannot be a mere copy of life, a blind imitation. 
he in fact believed in the direct participation in the life of the universe. And for a work of art to be of any lasting value, this sort of creativity, this kind of creative activity was needed. His appreciation of beauty is also notable, especially when we know how important a place Sri Aurobindo himself assigned to beauty in the creative scheme. So these are uh, some of the merits of James Cousins' book and his excellence as a critic. And yet, Sri Aurobindo reserves his criticism too against Cousins and directs our attention to the little drawbacks also. First of all, Sri Aurobindo feels that the book is too small a volume for the subject matter it deals with. That is, we may say, a lot of topics have been forcibly condensed into the pages and that evidently reduces the particular topic under discussion to its bare essentials. So it is not exhaustive and it cannot be all inclusive. Thus, Sri Aurobindo sort of accuses Cousins of being partial in his criticism as he deals with whom he appreciated and leaving out others from his detailed analysis, like uh, Thompson, Hardy, etc. In Sri Aurobindo's opinion, Cousins' book displays much of destructive criticism too, alongside his positive criticism. As an instance, he cites Cousin's essay on Singe, the Irish playwright, which Sri Aurobindo feels is a bit negative despite being interesting on other accounts. The Irish literary movement, its ideals and aims, these are the background against which Cousin studies the works of Singe. This takes away much from the positive appreciation of the dramatic power of the dramatist. To quote from Cousins directly, he says about Singe, the mind of Singe gathered to itself a mass of colloquialisms in phrase and action and out of these built up a set of personalities that are shadows of one another. His art was essentially lyrical and only secondarily dramatic in the classical sense of vivid contrast and conflict. And Cousins kind of denounces Singh's undue preoccupation with the verbal expression. And also he hesitates to put him in the category of the essential or absolute dramatist as he would willingly put Shakespeare. So um, in general, what we find is Cousin's attitude towards drama is a bit disparaging and we have already noted his preference for the lyric. Sri Aurobindo also refers to the fact that the architectural faculty and impulse in poetry does not find much favor with Cousin's. As he says, the artist to get a true perspective must step back out of the range of the detail of his picture. The thinker must get beyond reach of the things that provoke his thoughts if he would comprehend their full significance. And then he continues, if the poet wishes to catch the ear of the time, let him turn dramatist. If the dramatist has a wish to linger in the ear of all time, let him turn poet. So that one sentence perhaps is evidence of his preference for the lyric and not the drama. That is, he preferred lyric to drama. And Cousin says that the question of an artist's attitude to his art 
is of small concern to the general public. It is the work itself that matters, and it will be the work itself that will justify or condemn itself to the future. So these are some quotations from his book. And while discussing James Cousins' book, New Ways in English Literature, and dwelling on the merits and demerits of Cousins as a critic, Sri Aurobindo lengthens the topic into a discourse on contemporary criticism. One of the grave dangers of criticism, Sri Aurobindo says, is the charm, the attraction of new thought for the critic, which sometimes so influences his thought that he tends to get blinded to the defects of the work in hand. So what happens when we read a work of this kind? The real merits are misplaced from our view. And Sri Aurobindo points out the pitfalls of contemporary criticism, saying that because of the powerful cross currents of immediate attraction and repulsion, we are likely to be led off from the right track. <clears throat> Consequently, our judgment suffers. Also, when things are too near us in time, when we are living under the same conditions and in the same circumstances which we have to analyze, we tend to fall into the common error of getting the wrong perspective. And this somewhat distorts our judgment again, and we seldom get the right vision of things. So this is something that the discerning critic must be aware of. Okay, so to return to our initial question as to how Cousin's book is related to Sri Aurobindo's subject of the future poetry. Now, one answer to the question is that this particular book by Cousins raises relevant points related to the future of poetry. And so let's see now what are those. Um, yes, it's true that Sri Aurobindo is talking of future poetry. Yet, even he does not spell out exactly what it will be at this early stage, that is when he was writing, uh, say, almost a hundred years back, we may have, for the time being, only hints of what it will be like. It is, in a way, a bit unpredictable. Uh, so, after all, uh, future poetry is for the future. Uh, for instance, uh, we do not know, uh, we cannot predict how it will deal with the concepts of idealism and realism. Now, idealism and realism, these are two major important, important components of poetry, of art, of any theories of art. And nature versus art or real versus the ideal this has always posed as a puzzling equation from ancient times. And neither realism nor idealism has gone out of date. So um, again, let us deflect a moment uh, and recapitulate what these terms mean. That is how these concepts have come home to us. Now, idealism, this is the theory in art which gives more value to the imagination rather than the representation of stark reality. <clears throat> so by definition, it is a boundless realm, the realm of the imagination. And we have such notions as objective idealism, subjective idealism, even dualistic idealism. And here what we find is that feeling or will is given predominance and reality here is only an internal reality. 
art is not the imitation of nature. As one ancient poet said, the poet is not a recorder of facts. Historians take care of facts much better. So even if the poet has to present the reality, he has to present something better than reality or present reality in a different way. According to Plotinus, art is not a bare reproduction of the thing seen. It goes back to the ideas from which nature itself derives. So the idealists believe in pure forms and the advocates of absolute idealism believe in the reality of the inner self. And this is seen to be in conflict with the outer self sometimes. And it's true, we cannot know everything from our sensuous experience. So the formula of idealism may be taken to be that the world is my representation. For instance, look at this poem by Arthur Simmons. Uh, I'm quoting a few lines from this poem. He's saying, I set all Rome between us with what joy I set the wonder of the world against my world's delight. Rome that ha has conquered worlds with intellectual might, capture my heart and teach my memory to forget. This is from his poem called Dreams. Now, the Rome of his imagination, of his poem, may be a different Rome from what the others know. So realism, on the other hand, and as the name suggests, is the objective, faithful representation of reality in art. So evidently there is nothing very fanciful over here. So look at these lines from a poem. The poet says, before the unseen cock had called the time, those workers left their beds and stumbled out into the street where dust lay white as lime under the last star that keeps bats about. These lines from the English poet Maysfield from his poem called The Builders, these give us a picture of reality as everyone can see. But realists, however, have different concepts of reality. Here we find the predominance of the intellect as opposed to the idealistic feeling and will and includes within its scope much that is commonplace, monotonous and even meager. In fact, the realists feel that every subject is fit for the formative energy of the artist and the great triumph of art, according to them, lies in making us see common things in their real shape and form. The great poet Goethe said that art sticks to the surface of natural phenomena and doesn't pretend to show the metaphysical depth of things. And yet, we cannot say that realistic representation is purely objective. For no matter how bare an imitation of life it may be, there is displayed great imaginative power in realist art too. For instance, consider the works of the great artists Zola, Balzac or Flaubo. Or take these lines from the great poet Baudelaire where he's saying, With heart at rest I climbed the citadel's steep height and saw the city as from a tower, hospital, brothel, prison and such hells where evil comes up softly like a flower. The main aim of realism, however, is to offer an accurate rep representation of the reality. 
there is a lot of descriptive and evocative detail, but the fanciful and imaginary is generally avoided. <clears throat> In realist art, the modern and the contemporary are focused upon. So realism, if its opposite is to be sought, we must seek it in romanticism. For realism actually went in opposition to the fantasies of romanticism. And yet even realism and romanticism share one common feature and that is of projecting direct experience. So in James Cousins book, which we have been referring to, there is a discussion on realism and idealism. He takes up the issues in one of his chapters in the book. And Sri Aurobindo also feels there is actually no real difference between idealism and realism in poetry. He calls realism a sort of nether idealism and an inverse of perverse romanticism. Now, romanticism um, itself is a movement whose advocates believe in free play of the imagination, in using colloquial idioms, in using direct and simple speech. When we hear Wordsworth, the great romantic poet, saying, How oft in darkness and amid the many shapes of joyless daylight, when the fretful stir unprofitable and the fever of the world have hung upon the beatings of my heart, in his very famous poem, Tintern Abbey, we feel the line between the imagination and external reality is somewhat blurred. Sri Aurobindo says, realism in art is an attempt to reveal the creative truth by an effective force of presentation, by an intensity, often an exaggeration at the opposite side of the complex phenomena of life. In fact, realistic art rests on the contention that truth can be known through the senses. Of course, this trend of modern realism owes its origin to Descartes and Locke. In fact, if we take it to present the whole of the real world, it becomes kind of reductive. But of course, new theories regard reality not as the sole representation of the artist, but that which is produced by the combination of the artist, art and reader or viewer. And that's only very logical. Now, according to Sri Aurobindo, all art starts from the sensuous and sensible. It has the material or the physical as its basis. The sensuous is the artist's continual point of reference and the artist uses it as a symbol or even draws a fount of images upon and from it. The created work, the art, may soar higher and higher into invisible worlds, worlds beyond our ordinary vision, but even then its base is the earth from where it begins. Uh, I'm uh, temptingly reminded here of Shelley's poem and I would love to quote a few lines from his poem to a skylark, where the skylark is certainly a symbol, soaring and flying high, yet somewhere the connection with the base is retained. Uh, for instance, uh, these lines from the poem where he's saying, the pale purple even melts around thy flight, like a star of heaven in the broad daylight. Thou art unseen, but yet I hear thy shrill delight. So we see the connection is there. The link is there between the abstract 
and the concrete. In fact, all art, Sri Aurobindo tells us, must go beyond the visible, must rise above the merely sensuous and reveal to us what is hidden behind the visible. When Keats sings an ode to the nightingale, the bird ceases to be just a flesh and blood form. It becomes a symbol, a referral point for the poet to dwell on the theme of immortality and exists less in this earthly world of ours, but more so in the ideal world of the poet's creative imagination and itself becomes immortal. As the poet says, thou was not born for death, O bird. So we see the artist creates his own ideal world, an exclusive personal world, and that world is as real for its creator as our physical universe, as it exists as a reality in the imagination and vision of the artist. And when this idea, this experience, this impression is projected in and as a work of art, we know that the artist is projecting a truth, a truth which he has seen or felt or experienced. It may be truth in any form. It may be truth of any form, any kind, it may be truth of heaven, it may be truth of hell, but in the idea or the ideal world of the artist, it is real. For instance, say, when Milton, the epic poet, recounts the fall of Satan from heaven, saying, Him the almighty power hurled headlong, flaming from the ethereal sky, with hideous ruin and combustion, down to bottomless perdition, there to dwell in adamantine chains and penal fire. Do we think or do we know, is it a historical fact or even a scientific fact he is revealing? Perhaps not. It is something his creative mind conceived of and in the space of the epic, it is real. It is a form of a truth. So that's just one example I've given. Therefore, Sri Aurobindo tells us, art must be judged by the merit and value of that ideative truth, whether that is a general fact or something seen and experienced by everyone, that is not the criterion. In fact, it may not be so. It is the ideative truth mainly upon which our judgment ought to be based. And we should see also how powerfully the artist has presented his thoughts and impressions and judge also the perfection and beauty of his utterances. In one of his letters, Sri Aurobindo wrote about the realistic trend in art. He wrote about realism uh, saying that artists take something from life and by their imagination make a world of their own. Each artist is a creator of his own world. So the artist's world may not be an exact copy of the actual world. So what we find is that the physical, the concrete is made the basis for the invisible, the abstract, the hidden truth. And in the future poetry, Sri Aurobindo wrote that poetry always sways between two opposite trends. On one side, there is the predominance of subjective vision the personal, the subjective element. On the other side, 
there is the pull of the objective presentation. But Sri Aurobindo also tells us there is a realm beyond both these and poetry can rise beyond subjectivism and objectivism, beyond the exclusively personal and impersonal and reach the spiritual plane where all these distinctions are exceeded and all differences are reconciled. For instance, listen to these lines from Sri Aurobindo's Savitri, which I have always felt are located in a higher sphere. They spring from somewhere beyond the mind. Sri Aurobindo writes, I saw the omnipotence flaming pioneers over the heavenly verge which turns towards life, come crowding down the amber stairs of birth. So these are somewhat autobiographical as we have spiritual vision here. And perhaps they originate from an inner higher experience. And at the same time, they expound a deep spiritual philosophy. And of course, we may profitably look for many more instances from Sri Aurobindo's own writings. So as such, the genius creative mind is bound by no hard rules. Sri Aurobindo says, it follows its own course and makes its own shaping experiments. And in this context, he talks about the narrative and the dramatic forms in art and he feels that these forms will not easily be given up and discarded by the poetic imagination. The narrative and the dramatic are generally modes of objective expression. For instance, look at the many characters created by the dramatists. Look at the characters created by Shakespeare, uh, say Hamlet, Macbeth, Othello, Lear. These are all characters created by the dramatist, but none of these characters are Shakespeare himself. So nothing personal here. And it has been suggested that the dramatist loses himself in the place. Or say, for instance, how much of Homer do we encounter in the Iliad or the Odyssey? But Sri Aurobindo says the great poetic minds will still choose the dramatic for self-expression in spite of their dominant subjectivity. And this is amply borne out when we look at the creations of Maeterlinck, Yeats, or Rabindranath Tagore. The narrative and the dramatic will never go out of existence. But the point Sri Aurobindo makes is that he's saying it is difficult to predict what the new spirit in poetry will do with these existing modes and how it will handle this. And Sri Aurobindo ponders and leaves us pondering too as to whether the new poetic genius will use the old narrative and dramatic forms with certain modifications or transform these according to its own needs. In a certain way, James Cousins' book, New Ways in English Literature, which we have been referring to, gives us the starting point for our surmises and predictions for the future poetry of what we may expect from the poetic mind of the future and its power for creation and interpretation. And it is here exactly this point which is the most relevant for our study of the future poetry and directly related to the main subject. And that is James Cousins' suggestion of the possibility of the mantra. Mantra, that rhythmic speech which rises at once from the heart of the seer 
and from the distant home of the truth as sri arbindo explains it so very very briefly then if we look at these words we see the vital and important components of the mantra will be the rhythmic speech the truth and the seer poet who can utter and express that truth uh, the mantra is the discovery of the word the divine movement the form of thought proper to the reality which according to james cousins and i'm quoting the passage which sri aurobindo himself has quoted in his book so the mantra is that which lies in the apprehension of a something stable behind the instability of word and deed something that is a reflection of the fundamental passion of humanity for something beyond itself something that is a dim shadowing of the divine urge which is prompting all creation to unfold itself and to rise out of its limitations towards its godlike possibilities now my god that's a vast theory and in one breath the author has revealed and uttered the course the poetry of the future may take and sri aurobindo adds that in the past poetry had done that in moments of supreme elevation so we see that the mantra is something more than and higher and beyond the ordinary so in the past poets have uttered the mantra in rare moments of supreme elevation and as for the future sri aurobindo says that this type of supreme utterance may be a more conscious aim and steady endeavor of the poetic mind and that is the stand sri aurobindo takes about the poetry of the future the mantric word the mantric utterance and here we must again remind ourselves that sri aurobindo's theory of poetry and its evolution is only commensurate with the evolution of consciousness so um at the moment uh, i'm not going into any lengthy discussion or explanation of the mantra as we shall have plenty of occasions to do so in the next talks we can just um slightly acquaint ourselves with the mantra here um these are some lines i'm quoting from um uh, sri aurobindo savitri again and as we read them or as we listen to them we feel the power of the incantatory lines when our seer poet sri aurobindo sings in all we feel his presence and his power a blaze of his sovereign glory is the sun a glory is the gold and glimmering moon a glory is his dream of purple sky a march of his greatness are the wheeling stars his laughter of beauty breaks out in green trees his moments of beauty triumph in a flower the blue seas chant the rivulets wandering voice are murmurs falling from the eternal's harp and let us chant also this ancient mantra and feel the power of the words and the sound when the upanishadic rishi says and this is a prayer he has made for all occasions for eternity and that is the power of the mantra asato ma sad kamaya tamaso ma jyotir kamaya mrityor ma amritam kamaya so thank you for today